The whole point of a digital currency is that you end up with uh, people having a direct account, businesses, individuals, whatever, having a direct account with the Fed. The idea is that it gives the Fed greater control over economic events. If it doesn't like the look of you or me, then okay, we don't have an account. <laughs> you know, so this is actually a huge invasion of privacy and freedom. This week's special with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. One ounce silver buffalo rounds for only $2.99 over spot. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a returning guest. Alistair McLeod is the head of research at goldmoney.com. He's also a former bank president, and he does lots of research about international currencies, debts, interest rates, precious metals. He's here with us again on Liberty and Finance. Alistair, thanks for coming back on this Thursday, January 6, 2022. It's my pleasure, DK. In the build-up to the end of the year, there was a lot of anticipation from many people that the Basel III net stable funds uh, requirements would cause a sea change in the way that uh, metals markets work. And that's one of the questions we want to get to that a, that a viewer has asked uh, a little bit later. Also, another viewer asked about the U.S. dollar as the world reserve currency in an era when many currencies may be going digital with central bank digital currencies, et cetera. So we want to get to those two main questions. But first, you recently uh, wrote an article about the effect of interest rates and uh, currency inflation that is maybe surpassing what people are really aware of. And uh, could you clue us in on why you think people are missing the boat here and why we need to be aware? Yeah, I mean, th there have been uh, various um, sort of analysts, commentators, whatever, looking at the situation of price inflation and um, saying, oh, it's, it's like the 1970s again. Now, that's a sort of a fairly glib comment. Um, but pursuing that line, if you actually look at what happened in the 1970s compared with now, the comparison you need to make is with Britain or the United Kingdom and America now. Because in those days, America was not running a massive trade um, deficit. I mean, it, I think it was in 1971, 72, maybe 73, I can't remember the exact date, but um, a deficit did arise. Um, and I think it was around about 3 billion, but this was due to the oil price shooting up. Um, we had various oil crises. Um, once you, you know, after the Nixon shock, um, uh, OPEC really, um, you know, sort of held the West to ransom, or you could put it that way, by raising oil prices. So, so that led to um, an American deficit of around about 3 billion. It was an absolute record at the time, as you may imagine. But the budget deficit... Um, the most it got to was $76 million. Now, that compares with $3.1 trillion in 2020. I mean, that's something like 47,000 times as big. So it gives you an idea of the scale of how the numbers have changed, uh, which is quite frightening when you look at it. Um, but the country that really had the similar situation to the United States today, uh, and indeed has gotten coming back again, is the United Kingdom. Um, we had, um, in those days, a socialist government, just the same as you have a socialist government. Uh, we had, um, we were running a budget deficit. The budget deficit ran to a record 6.3%, something like that. Uh, the American budget deficit um, for two years on the trot has been running at almost double that. So that's a far worse condition. Um, the rate of monetary growth, um, the most it was, I mean, if I go back to the US now, the most it was during the 1970s was one year it, it, it rose something like 13%. Uh, we're looking at broad money in that context, uh, M2, M3. M2 um, is the only one, really, that the Fed still continues with. And if you look at the M, at M2, I mean, that for two consecutive years has grown at um, sort of 25%, 24%, 25%. So, you know, I mean, it, 
Uh, what's happening now is far worse than what happened to Britain in the 1970s. Uh, Britain had to call in the IMF um, uh, to get a loan of uh, three and a half billion dollars to bail out uh, socialist government. And I think that would have been in uh, 75. Um, I mean, it's a real scandal because the whole point of the IMF was, um, you know, for America, if you like, to help sort of police the world financially. And it was never anticipated that a, an advanced nation would need to turn to the IMF. The IMF was there to make, you know, loans and help um, spread the dollar influence, if you like, amongst um, emerging nations. So, you know, this was if you like, an abuse of privilege, I mean, is the way to put it. But uh, the, the British government at that time had nowhere else to go. And the thing that's fascinating is, and this is where I think the big difference occurs. I mean, we had uh, funding dislocations because it was quite clear that uh, the politicians in Whitehall and in the UK um, Treasury Ministry uh, you know, they were rabid Keynesians. I mean, they really were. They, 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 they didn't believe, believe in, if you like, what we would call classical economics or Austrian economics. You know, sort of, even though Hayek was lecturing uh, um, at the London um, School of Economics, I mean, you know, no way were they ever considering that sort of thing. We were absolutely firmly Keynesian. I mean, you know, Keynes was a British boy, for goodness sake, so... <laughs> You know, in a sense, it's hardly surprising. Anyway, the problem was that um, they reckoned that, um, you know, governments uh, ran markets better than free markets ran themselves. So, so um, you know, government had a right to intervene and had a right to set prices for money and everything else. Um, the problem was when that started coming unstuck with the rate of price inflation beginning to rise and rise and rise and rise. Um, what we had was um, funding dislocation. And, um, you know, the situation would have to get so bad that eventually the politicians and the Treasury would turn around to the Bank of England and throw in the towel and say, OK, we give up, you, you know, you sort it out. Now, this led to three gilts being issued, one with a 15% coupon. These are on separate occasions, by the way. This wasn't all at the same time. 15% coupon, 15.25% coupon, 15.5% coupon. The 15 and a half of 98, I remember it well. That was the highest coupon that they issued at the time. Um, these funding dislocations could only be um, unlocked by the Bank of England raising rates to the point where um, money started coming in, invest, you know, investment money started coming in, and particularly from foreign holders of sterling. Because we're a trading nation, so we always had a fair element of foreign ownership of sterling, in exactly the same way as um, uh, foreigners own dollars today. I mean, dollar, you know, foreigners own roughly one and a half times your GDP in dollars and and financial assets. I mean, we're talking over $33 trillion. This, you know, so that's another similarity, but again, worse today than it was for the UK uh, back then. So the question arises, we now have um, price inflation taking off. We have had the expansion of currency and credit, which, um, as I say, in two years in a row measured by M2, um, have been, I think it was 23, 24% consecutive rises. Um, and in fact, that was understated because what you have to do, particularly recently, is you have to take out the money that's been reabsorbed by the Fed on a very temporary basis through their reverse repos. Now, on the 31st of December, that was $1.9 trillion. I mean, it was an enormous slug of money. This is money which um, the money funds uh, had, have. Um, and of course, you know, the, the USP is, um, you know, we will protect the buck, you know, so we will protect your capital. It'll never dip below par. Um, and we will hold safe, you know, everything that's safe. So it's US Treasury bills, basically, that, that sort of thing. Repos as well, because US Treasury bill rates went down to 
um, you know, sort of just a few basis points. Um, it's since that since the new year, it's rallied because, um, you know, you, you bond yields uh, in the United States, um, you know, your followers may not be aware of this. They have actually rallied very, very sharply in the first few trading days of this year. Um, so that's come off a little bit. But getting back to the situation in the markets, I don't know of anyone who's actually thinking that it's possible that interest rates, um, the you know the price, if you like, of, of of government funding, may go up more than one and a half two percent. Um, yet on half the situation we had in the UK, and admittedly, you know, uh, the UK probably hadn't as much international credence, <laughs> if you like, as the dollar does. Um, you know, we got coupons of over fifteen percent and over. So you know that tells us an awful lot about the difference between current expectations and how reality is likely to play out. Now, I wouldn't sit here and forecast that you're going to see 15% bond yields. I don't know what they will go to. There are other things that are happening which um, would disrupt disrupt any scenario. I mean, you know, you can sit and make a forecast. And, I mean, it's, it's just a waste of time because, um, you know, it's not just America. If you look at Japan, um, but um, the thing that's interesting is that Japan and uh, the Eurozone are both stuck under, uh, you know, with negative interest rates in IRP. Um, and it is very hard to see how they can get out of it. Yet here we have dollar rates going up. We've got sterling rates going up. So those two currencies are strong relative to the yen and the euro, which have been extremely weak. And that's telling us that the markets are beginning to sort of understand, oh, hold on a minute. These currencies have got a problem <laughs> sort of thing. So we have seen uh, a substantial fall in uh, the, the yen relative to the dollar. Now, it's, it's, it's upside down because of the way we, you know, we, we, we quote it. Um, and uh, uh, there's been a significant drift down in the euro uh, really over the last three months. So this is this is something which is live and 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 developing. So um, the other thing that's interesting is that we started. I mentioned that you know we were all Keynesians in in uh, uh, in 1970. Um, what then happened is that as the sort of Keynesian idea, the Keynesian beliefs got blown out of the water, a chap called Milton Friedman, one of your compatriots, suddenly was in the headlines, you know, and he was saying, you know, that, that, that um, you know, the, the root of all this is the expansion of the quantity of money. Da, 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 da. And so monetarism suddenly um, became a lot more credible. Now, just think what happens to the situation in America where you've got M1, M2 through the roof. Actually, we put M M1 to one side because um, they haven't backdated the figures beyond March last year. So that's a, a bad um, uh, indicator, if you like. But certainly there has been a massive expansion of, um, of, of broad money. And it is that is on top of a further expansion since um, uh, uh, the Lehman crisis. In fact, if you look at M2, it's gone up roughly a further 200 percent. So it's three times what it was at the time of Lehman. You know, this, this is massive inflation. I, I mean, you know, quite simple. So as people begin to move off um, Yellen's um, Keynesian approach um, and perhaps Jay Powell's Keynesian approach, they're going to move into uh, a monetarist, uh, quasi-monetarist approach. I don't think that the Austrians will ever really sort of be listened to too much because we are too extreme, I think, for most of these uh, policymakers. But you can see that the effect of monetarism coming back and people beginning to understand that there is a relationship in terms of inflation is actually money supply, not you know, some um, nasty producer putting up his prices and profiteering and all the rest of it, which is basically, you know, what's being pushed by your socialist administration. So um, think of the shock on markets when people begin to realize, you know, it's not evil capitalists that are driving this, but it's the increasing quantity of money diluting its purchasing power. And that, I think, is a factor which I don't think anybody is really 
uh, thinking about. And it's been fascinating watching, um, you know, the brokers forecast for 2022. I mean, they're just pushing out, you know, sort of the Keynesian rubbish of the past. They did that, you know, they're just completely blind to what actually is happening. None of them seem to think that interest rates are going to go up just to, you know, a little bit more than and worse than that, they think the reason that interest rates are rising isn't so much because of the loss of purchasing power of the dollar. What they're thinking is that interest rates are rising because the economy is going to recover. I mean, come on, give us a break. You know, <laughs> you've got um, supply disruption, uh, logistical disruption everywhere. Half the ports in China are, co are closed because you know, the way the Chinese Communist Party works is you cannot move without our authority. And they have a policy of keeping Omicron out. So you can see that, um, you know, they've closed half their ports. I mean, this is very serious. And they don't have drivers, you know, with licenses to get into the port. So um, this is going to continue and continue and continue. And um, underlying all this is a is a is a is a uh, a, a problem that the Keynesians have. They think that interest rates reflect the cost of money. Push down interest rates, you know, push down the cost of money, and then the economy can take off. It is not the cost of money. What it reflects is the loss of purchasing power of money plus the time preference for losing possession of your money and getting it back at a later date. So they're putting the cart before the horse on interest rates. And unfortunately, this is what is driving interest rate policy. And this is why we've got ourselves into this ridiculous situation of zero interest rates, or worse than that, in two of the major uh, economic actors, the Eurozone and Japan, negative rates. So I think 2022 is going to be a year when um, these fallacies get corrected and you'll see interest rates rise very, very substantially. Tell us about where you will expect to see that, that increase in interest rates. It will, if it will not come explicitly from the mouth of the policymakers, where will we see it? Well, I think um, I was, I was contemplating this the other day. And I, I think in the coming months, um, I don't know in the next month or whatever, but I think you'll find that um, we'll move from the 6.8. I mean, it might move down. I don't know. You need to look at what's happening on the other end of a moving statistic. But I think over the next two or three months, you might find this going sort of 7, 8%, 9%, something like that. Because if you look at what's happened to commodity prices, and oil, incidentally, is up sharply again today. Um, if So if you look at commodity prices, if you look at um, the supply chain disruptions, which are continuing, you look at um, the uh, costs that producers face. I mean, not just cost of capital, but cost of, um, you know, labor and particularly skilled labor and so on and so forth. I mean, these are costs which, if they're not passed on, then capacity disappears from the economy. And um, consequently, um, you know, consumer prices will rise. So this is, this is uh, I think, uh, something which um, we will see as the statistics develop. And I think we just don't, we don't just look at what's going on for the dollar. We ought to also regard how this is affecting other currencies. I mean, the increase in, in producer prices in places like Spain, I think I saw was 19% or something annualized. I mean, this was huge. Germany was something like, I can't remember, I think it was 13%. So, yeah, you know, we're getting big numbers uh, feeding into, um, you know, on the supply side. Um, on the consumer side, um, you know, it's going to be affected and you're going to find these consumer prices rising. I mean, we've, we're not even um, uh, giving any credence to um, uh, John Williams and his work at Shadow Stats. I mean, he's already looking at, a, um, you know, sort of unadjusted uh, basis. Uh, the CPI should be rising at around about, I think, 15 percent or something like that. So um, and that's another thing. I mean, if you when you actually make the link. Uh, you know, when everybody begins to make the link between money um, uh, and inflation rather than prices and inflation, I think they will look anew at shadow stats and realize that actually what's happened is that the authorities have suppressed, I mean, suppressed the, the um, uh, statistical level of price changes and they will begin to 
unravel, I think, all these factors which have been put in place by the authorities to ensure that we don't get unduly alarmed. I mean, it's not just it's not just rising prices. I mean, you look at the unemployment numbers. I mean, the, the best way to look at unemployment numbers is actually who is drawing unemployment benefit. But no, what we get is we get a um, we get a, is it a weekly or monthly survey? Come on, you know I think some things. I, I seem to remember um, reading sixty five thousand people are surveyed, and you know that's not the way to do it. You know what are the real numbers? Not you know sort of somebody going around with a clipboard saying uh, now tell me <laughs> what are your what is your employment position etc. Et you know I mean. You can fiddle numbers like that very, very easily. And I'm sorry to say this, but I do not trust politicians and numbers. There's a, an elephant in the room that I wanted to follow up with you on because everything you're talking about is burgeoning uh, prices and in um, and uh, currency inflation, volume of currency, that sort of thing, uh, and how it's, it's being played out in things like oil and other uh, areas and that that you don't see any end in sight because of the supply chain disruptions the production disruptions the producer costs and so on but what about precious metals <laughs> precious metals especially silver can also be considered a commodity and they have producer costs and and yet and here especially now at the beginning of 2022 with the basel three net stable funding requirement uh, having uh, coming into uh, scheduled effect we anticipated, or many people did, that there would be significant noticeable changes in the way that metals were traded and that if there was um, not statistical suppression but actual uh, price suppression of futures going on, that that would be muted because it would no longer be as profitable uh, on, on, on bullion banks' balance sheets. Can you bring us up to date on what is still causing? We've, we've seen a, a two-day uh, push down in, for example, silver prices uh, by approximately 5% here. And uh, people are wondering, how can how can silver, for example, be the only commodity that's still at less than half of its former high from 40 years ago, etc.? Uh, so help us reconcile your view of silver versus all other commodities in this inflationary environment. Well, uh, you've got two questions in there. I'll tackle the silver one first. Um, I mean, silver, I think, is is particularly interesting because it is um, the best conductor known to man, electrical conductor known to man. And so with um, the, um, you know, environmental thing, um, ESG, environment, social governance and all the rest of it, um, uh, you know, Everything is is being moved away from fossil fuels. Uh, it's being moved towards electricity, towards battery power, towards nuclear, uh, lithium. Now, if you look last year, what happened to the price of uh, of lithium? It increased roughly five hundred percent, I think, <clears throat> four or five hundred percent. Problem with lithium is that um, you don't really have um, a futures market um, so that you and I can go and buy contracts in it and all the rest of it. All you can do is buy share, you know, shares in a lithium miner, if you like. Um, and of course, the other thing, uranium, I mean, that almost doubled. So why did silver halve? I mean, it just not not half. Sorry, it, 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 it was down from I think it's, it, it was up at what, $30 at one stage, and it's currently around about 22. I mean, it is completely nonsensical. And uh, there is no doubt that um, because uh, the system, if I can put it that way, is short to speculators, which is really what um, uh, uh, um, derivatives are all about, um, it has not been in their interest to let the price run away. It, it's as simple as that. Um, so I think what the story could be for silver uh, next year is that there's a monetary story, which, you know, we've we've touched on and probably will discuss a little bit more. Uh, but there is also the industrial use story. So it is just completely mispriced. Um, I, I can't see that there is the mine production to satisfy the potential industrial demand for silver, let alone the combination of industrial demand as is. Uh, and and uh, investment demand on top. Um, I mean, we're talking about something like um, a billion ounces a year, if you like, of silver, which is mined or 
um, you know, recovered from scrap. This, this, you know, it, it's not huge, um, and it doesn't take a huge amount of money to shift it, um, as various people in the past have tried to do. Um, I think one of the things that worked badly for silver was uh, this Robin Hood, you know, thing. I mean, sort of various silver bulls who you and I will know, uh, you know, sort of try to encourage uh, the small punter to, you know, buy a contract or go and buy um, SLV or one of the other ETFs, silver ETFs, um, uh, in order to create a shortage in the market. And that created a spike up to 30. But what it did Unfortunately, it had introduced an awful lot of weak holders. And so the price has been suffering ever since because, you know, when it backed off from 30, um, you know, these people who didn't really know what was happening um, other than, uh, you know, this seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, they got no other reason really to hold silver. Um, that provided the sentiment background, I think. So that's not been helpful. Now, to to turn to uh, Basel III, it, we're particularly looking at um, the uh, net stable funding ratio, which which is um, a new regulation which has now been introduced into America, into Europe, and as of the beginning of this month, into the UK. And uh, what it does is it penalizes uh, banks in terms of their, the funding of the assets of their balance sheet um, if they use them to have derivatives. It also, incidentally, penalizes them for various other things. So it's not we're not just talking gold and silver. We're not just talking wider derivatives. We're not just talking um, uh, running bull positions or bear positions in stocks. Um, we are not just talking about, um, you know, what's the difference between small depositors and large depositors, because there is a difference in terms of how you fund your balance sheet with, the, with those two categories alone. So this is um, a far wider situation than just the area in which you and I and our various followers are, are interested in. It is not um, a regulatory requirement for a bank to um, have you know, let's say, you know, uh, one approach, one strategy, one business strategy as opposed to another. All we're talking about is how it is funded. So if a bank wants to run an uneven, une uneven book, whether it's in derivatives or gold, silver, whatever, then basically that bank is going to have a cost hurdle to overcome. And it's the cost of funding it from the other side. It will restrict what the bank can do in other areas. Now, that is already in place. But what it does not do, and this is where the confusion lies, I think, is it does not force a bank suddenly to say, oh, the regulator says we can't have an open position in gold or silver in derivatives, so we're going to close it down. It does not do that. And I think it's very important to get that point over. What it will do, I think, in the long term, however, is that um, I think that a bank which values its reputation with the regulator might try and become cleaner in terms of its approach under the net stable funding ratio than it is at the moment. So what I would see over a period of time is banks being less involved, if you like, in the wider derivative world than they are today. But this is not something they're going to do overnight. I mean, we're looking at something that is going to take some time if indeed uh, it happens, because from a bank's point of view, I mean, basically what the Treasury Department of the bank will do is it will turn around to the traders, say, on the gold desk and say, right, we're raising the hurdle here because it, uh, because of our cost of funding. So instead of you uh, us expecting you to make 10 percent per annum on you know, the, the, the capital that we allocate, we now expect you to make 15. <laughs> if you don't like it, go away. <laughs> so, you know, so I think that's what's going to happen. I, it's not suddenly new rules in place. Everybody's got to comply. Yeah, that last point you made, I think, is something that I was going to ask you about is we've been told uh, by many, uh, Ted Butler and others, that, that the uh, JP Morgan and other bullion banks have had a 
basically an unnaturally successful track record of profitable trades in the bullion space, basically wildly profitable. And so in that context, if you have a business activity that's wildly profitable and where you can basically hit home runs 100% of the time or approximately that, then a 15% uh, added cost of doing business on your funding of it may be just a mild annoyance rather than something that's going to actually shut it down. Is that is that what we're getting? Yes, I think that's I think that's fair. And um, uh, you know, while uh, the Bank of International Settlements was tasked with a new Basel set of new Basel regulations, uh, which is, I mean, this 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 came out of the Lehman crisis uh, in two thousand and eight nine. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think any um, uh, central bank or monetary authority, I mean, whatever you like to call them, um, actually wants um, this to force banks to withdraw from market making of whatever sort it is. Um, they see it as, if you like, uh, uh, certainly an additional cost, and they see it as something which, uh, you know, perhaps gives it, it, it reduces, if you like, the systemic risk of the system. So they will welcome these changes, but um, not to the point where banks completely withdraw from um, market making and other um, market activities and derivatives as a whole. Because, I mean, the deriv derivatives are absolutely enormous. I mean, we're talking about, um, I mean, it's come down somewhat, but we're talking about something like 700 trillions worth of outstanding over-the-counter derivatives. I mean, this is absolutely huge. Um, most of that's in things like, uh, you know, foreign exchange, credit fault swaps, and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, they don't want to get, get rid of that. What they want to do is just ensure it's not quite so risky, systemically risky. It's a very complex uh, system for people to try to understand. Those of us who are just trying to make our way forward, trying to understand so what, what is the outcome outcome of this? What does it mean to us? What does it mean to markets? Are things going to finally get to be more uh, fair, open, real, you know, cash on the nail, <laughs> that kind of thing rather than, but uh, we'll, uh, we appreciate your, you know, continued insight into that as, as things move forward. And, and please do keep us appraised of what you see. If you do see evidence along the way of behavioral changes on the parts of any of these bullion banks and the way that they're managing their books and that sort of thing. We would find it uh, most illuminating uh, when that happens. We have a, another question. It's one that we alluded to earlier about the world reserve currency in the, in the era of digi central bank digital currencies. A, a viewer, Joe G, wrote a rather extended question. I'm going to read it um, and uh, I'd like to get you to weigh in on it. He says, when the, quote, reset happens and the U.S., EU, Britain, etc., all have digital currencies. Is the U.S. dollar likely to still be the world reserve currency? With the BIS likely to dis to deploy their SDR, what will be the outcome if China, Russia, India, and even Turkey back their digital currency with gold? Turkey has real financial troubles with their currency now, but they have a 5,000-year relationship with gold. Germany holds 3.35 thousand tons of gold, would they be likely to stay in the euro currency when they hold that much real money versus currency? I think the question of who has the world reserve currency might have a deadly outcome if the U.S. won't give it up and may well go to war to maintain their grasp. So uh, your view of the world reserve currency uh, in the future and what major factors you think are going to drive that? Yeah, um, I think Joe G has actually asked... Um, <laughs> I mean, there the, are the, the elements in this question which um, are assumptions, um, but, uh, you know, the topic is actually extremely important. And I think, um, you know, I'll try and sort of work my way through it. This question of digital currencies, I think, is very, very interesting. Um, so far, um, the people who have been involved have basically been central banks. It's all been, um, if you like, coordinated by the Bank of International Settlements. They've set up a committee. And the committee gets all the information in from the various central banks as to what they're doing, what their intentions are, um, how they're progressing, and they're disseminating that information out to help other central banks uh, formulate a digital currency policy. So this is very definitely something that is developing. Um, when it comes to America um, uh, doing this, I think we then start running into problems because um, then starts moving from the arena of the central bank, 
uh, the Fed into um, uh, the political arena and the commercial banking arena. The whole point of a digital currency is that you end up with uh, people having a direct account, businesses, individuals, whatever, having a direct account with the Fed, which bypasses the commercial banking network. So the first question we've got to ask is, how are the commercial banks going to react to having this business stolen from them? I, I mean, I would have thought that um, they won't be very positive about it. Now, the American political system, so far as I understand it, is that banks effectively sponsor um, the politicians, both Democrats and and Republicans. So I think anyone um, who supports a move towards digital currencies um, in this format, I mean, you know, it may not, not, not you know, they, they, they may modify it into something else, I don't know. But assuming that um, the idea is that it gives the Fed greater control over economic events, which, which, which happens because the Fed actually can direct the money to individual businesses, um, individual sectors, individuals. Um, and it can deal with things like money laundering because, you know, if it doesn't like the look of you or me, then, OK, we don't have an account. <laughs> you know, we, So this is actually a huge invasion of privacy and freedom uh, on, on everybody. If the banks go along with this, um, I, I mean, I can't see them going along with it at all. And so I think that any... Any politician who thinks this is a good idea and will vote for the enabling legislation in the Senate, I think will find himself cut off in terms of funding from his friends in the banking system. So I would I would um, think it's actually quite unlikely that in America it will get very far. There is, of course, the other aspect which uh, your um, follower touched on, Joe G, um, and that is... Um, uh, you know, the, the, that uh, these digital currencies, if they're successful, and he also mentions gold, if that's, you know, if that comes back as part of the monetary system backing some of the fiat currencies, um, then it really does impinge on um, the dollar's reserve status and the degree of control that gives America over financial events around the world. So they're going to, I think the Americans are going to be very reluctant to permit this to happen. So, I mean, so far we've had a few very minor banks. I think in the Bahamas they've tried to do something. I think that in China they've had a some sort of pilot thing. We don't hear anything about it now. Um, <clears throat> but I think if it started, you know, if, 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 if for example, the Bank of England or uh, the ECB or whatever started thinking, well, this is a jolly good idea, you know, we, we will force this through. I think the Americans will have something to say about it because um, they won't want to lose the power that the reserve currency status, the hegemony, if you like, of the dollar gives them. Um, so I actually don't see it happening. I think that's that's the important point. Um, I think the other point I'd like to make is that I think events are going to – no, let me just wind back. Um, we do actually have a historical precedent for this situation where um, one failing currency is replaced by the authorities with another currency, which subsequently failed. And I'm referring back to uh, the time of the French Revolution, um, the Assignat, um, uh, which started off, if you like, as a as a bond, which and the idea was that it could act as a currency. And it actually had a yield. Um, uh, and <laughs> it was issued in increasing quantities. And the result was its purchasing power, well, went down. It wasn't convertible into specie, you know, gold or silver. Um, when that failed, they came up with another bright idea. Let's come, come out. Let's, uh, there's a new currency, the Territorio Mandat. And that failed. I mean, you know, initially, people were glad to get rid of the old assignat. Um, you know, they had bonfires burning these notes in the <laughs> in the center of Paris. Um, and they welcomed this new currency. But within six months, it had gone completely. So, you know, if you want to have currency stability, you do not achieve it 
by replacing one fiat currency with another fiat currency. And the point that gets lost in all this is that um, the reason that the fiat currency fails, let's put it very simply, is that people lose the faith and credit in the issuer. Um, so the issuer can issue a new currency, a digital currency or a new fiat currency, whatever it might be. But the thing that has gone is the full faith and credit in the issuer. That is the key. And this is why gold always comes back. Gold and silver always comes back. Uh, and I'm talking physical, not some sort of representation of it that cannot be exchanged for gold or silver. Um, always comes back to replace failing fiat. So, and in the current environment, I mean, we've we talked earlier about uh, the interest rate outlook. Um, that's going to be destabilizing. And uh, I think that, um, I mean, if you look at Japan, um, as they struggle to um, allow interest rates to rise in order to protect the currency in terms of its purchasing power, um, then you've got to bear in mind that the banks have um, a gearing ratio of capital to equity of in excess of 20 times. All the big ones have. I mean, this is, you know, this is horrendous. In Europe, you have got some banks on as much as 30 times. Um, now, that's in the Eurozone. Um, the UK has got some which are looking like, I think Barclays are something like 20. I, I, you know, I, I, without looking at my notes on this, I'm not too sure of the figures, but I mean, they are very heavily leveraged. Uh, America and China are not so leveraged. Uh, America is around about 10, 11 times. Uh, China is similarly about 11, maybe 11, 12 times. So, um, that is high. I mean, that really is high. Um, uh, you know, you would in the past, you would reckon that it was sort of eight to 10 times leverage is high. Um, but um, we're looking at over double that. So just imagine um, the effect of higher interest rates, um, the bankruptcies that anything like, you know, we've been discussing, you know, the sort of 15% coupons, anything getting to any, not even anywhere near that, you're going to have zombie companies loaded up with unproductive debt going under. So what does that do? And also, what does it do to the collateral that uh, the banks hold? I mean, we're looking at an equity market, which with rising interest rates of anything, you know, sort of a tenth of that, well, no, a quarter of that, you're going to see a bear market developing in equities. So um, the value of the collateral held by banks um, against their loans is going to be going down. So they're going to be false sellers. The foreigners are going to be false sellers. I mean, they got $14 trillion of US equities. What's the point of them having US equities? I'll tell you, there's only one reason they hold the US equities, and that is because they think they're going to make money out of it. They're not told by a regulator, you've got to hold U.S. equities. No, the regulator might turn around and say, you've got to have a balanced portfolio in domestic equities. But they won't tell them, that. you know, they won't tell anyone um, other than trying to limit what they push abroad. Um, so you've got about $14 trillion worth of um, uh, foreign investment in the equity market alone uh, likely to come unstuck. American investors have got very little foreign currency. It's less than a trillion dollars. I think on the last tick figures, we were looking at something like $680 billion. Um, but um, they've got, a, I think, I think the figure is something like um, 12 trillion um, in foreign equities. So again, when you see your market tank, <clears throat> what do you do? Sell your stocks? No, you sell the foreign stuff. So that, you know, so you're going you know, the, a bear market in America is going to be tra transmitted around the world. I mean, make no mistake about it. Uh, and uh, the banks which are highly leveraged are very vulnerable to those circumstances. I mean, this is um, <clears throat> this was a point made by Irving Fisher in the wake of 1932-1933 uh, banking crisis. Um, you know, he analyzed it and uh, described it quite correctly that uh, uh, you know, the falling value of uh, collateral was forcing banks to sell collateral in the, into the market, which was making other banks go under. I mean, the whole thing, you know, it was a sort of implosion, if you like. We have the risk that this can happen again. And um, <clears throat> it's not just America. It's everywhere around the world. We're all in the same situation. 
the one thing I didn't hear you say in there, maybe I missed it, was that the last part of the question is, if the U.S. won't give it, give up their reserve currency, it may, have, may well go to war to maintain their grasp. You did mention specifically the loss of faith and credit in the power, in the keepers of the reserve currency. It's like, well, we don't trust you anymore. But when that uh, trust is lost, and yet the keepers have the power to say, yes, but we've got you uh, by the throat because you can't transact unless we say so. Uh, you know, if, if there is this centralization of control, uh, isn't that the ultimate of fiat power is you don't need to have someone trusting you. you they just have to obey because you've got, you've got them and they don't have any other options. Yes. I mean, I think that power gets taken away by um, the markets. And when I say the markets, I mean, it's, it's collectively all of us who are users of this currency. Um, if we lose our faith in it, then it's valueless. It's actually as simple as that. I mean, it may not go valueless overnight, but you find that quite quickly it can happen. I mean, the same thing happened, we've discussed this before with John Law in France in 1720. I mean, it took roughly six months for the um, for his livre, his, which is French for pound, to go down to pretty much zero. So, um, and that's what happens. Um, I think that uh, we are likely to see uh, the Asian bloc, as it were, which is really controlled or dominated, is probably a better word, by uh, China and Russia uh, through the vehicle of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And I mean, they've got about 40% of the world's population. And, you know, particularly if you in include the um, Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia, I mean, we're looking at uh, almost half the world's population. Um, and also, of course, uh, they've pretty well got uh, sub Saharan Africa tied up. That's another billion. So, um, you know, with a collapsing dollar, I think there will come a point where the Chinese um, and the Russians will reveal their true um, gold backing. Now, if they're sensible about it, <clears throat> they will make it exchangeable for their paper currencies so that their paper currencies become, uh, um, uh, if you like, uh, you know, sort of gold equivalents. Um, and uh, it would have to be a coin exchange standard. In other words, you should be able to take your yuan or your rubles into a bank, um, give them to the bank, and the bank gives you gold coin or silver coin back. You know, I mean, it should work like that. A bullion exchange standard is not good enough. I mean, it really is not. Um, you've got to have this sort of, you know, people have got to understand <clears throat> that gold is money, silver is money. Um, and uh, the paper that comes out of the bank is a promissory note. And no more than that. Difference between money and currency, which again, we've, we've, we've discussed before. Um, I mean, we don't know how it will play out. But I think, uh, you know, I mean, when these things happen, um, politicians can get very, very stupid. I mean, they really can. Now, it, the, the history of inflation shows this. I mean, we're already seeing this uh, beginning with, I'm sorry to say, with Joe Biden, who's now blaming industry for rising prices in America. You know, come on. <laughs> you know, any any um, anyone who's sort of read any history of these things knows uh, two things. Firstly, <clears throat> that money is involved, which, you know, we're going to learn again, which we discussed earlier. And the second thing is that any attempt to try and curb price rises by, you know, price controls, uh, whatever, uh, has always failed in the past. And if you don't understand why, just note that it's always failed in the past. So it's unlikely to happen, you know, work this time. So, but anyway, <clears throat> they are going down that path. And I just hope that um, it doesn't end up with some sort of war. There is going to be enormous civil disruption. But I'm quite hopeful for um, <clears throat> for, the, for uh, the Americans in the sense that um, you are a nation of immigrants, basically. Um, and um, the point about being an immigrant or your parents or grandparents being immigrants is that you moved away from um, mercantilist control you know, whether it was in Britain, Germany, China, now, wherever, you've moved away from that. You have voted with your feet. I think as a nation, you are unlikely to support moves which continue to restrict your freedom. 
there is a silent majority in America which just basically poked up its head when, when uh, Donald Trump came along. Um, I'm not saying that Donald Trump is the answer to anything, but what I would say is that I think there is that sort of fundamental um, market freedom decency in America, which we don't hear enough of, but my goodness, it certainly exists. And that I think is a good thing in terms of um, influencing outcomes. We do certainly hope that an instinctive return to uh, basically, uh, you know, God given or natural rights and freedoms uh, does emerge that people wake up and realize, wait a minute, we've been sold. We've been sold our own slavery if we continue to walk down this path. And um, that's partly what our channel is about. Uh, liberty and finance is about that freedom that comes from taking back our natural freedoms. Uh, Alistair, we're always grateful for your presence here. If people want to follow your work, remind them where they can see your weekly writings. Yeah, uh, goldmoney.com um, and uh, hit the research tab and you'll find insights, which uh, I write every Thursday and I've just published one as we were referring earlier. Uh, and I do a market report um, every Friday and they're released sort of midday, uh, midday-ish, I would say, um, uh, EST, Eastern Standard Time. And while you're there, you might um, consider opening an account because uh, you'll be able to buy gold and silver Platinum Group Metals through Gold Money. That's, that's what we're for. Alistair McLeod, Head of Research at GoldMoney.com. Thank you, as always, for joining us here on Liberty and Finance. My pleasure, David. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin. Satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, Service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs. 